Good morning and welcome to Hollywood Church. My name is Keith Cobb and to borrow off of one of the uh, famous uh, newscasters uh, from Fox News who is no longer with them when he used to talk about a spin-free zone, I'm going to say that you have just entered into a no politics zone. And even though political things are on the minds and the mouths of most people, I will tell you what's on our heart, and that is God and God's word and God's people and God's promises. And we will pray for our nation and we will pray for God's grace and for his help because we surely do need it no matter who is elected. But before we go into our prayer, let me talk to you about how thankful I am that you have been participating with us at Hollywood Church. We have seen a number of increases in our attendance uh, for the last several Sundays, and we're very thankful. But we're being very careful as well and hope that if you still are not comfortable with attending, that you will pray for the safety and the protection of all of us who are meeting and gathering together. You are very much a part of the church, even though you may not be physically able to attend, and our prayers are with you. So thank you for caring, thank you for praying, and thank you for your encouragement. And we do pray that God would bless and encourage and enrich you as well. We are nearing the time of year when our elders will consider the church budget. And so if you have anything that you feel would be helpful or if you have any input uh, that you would like to present, any one of the elders would be glad to hear from you, and so would I. Uh, we usually plan the budget in November, and then we go through and refine it in December so that everything can be enacted in January and so we're in that process please pray for your elders and your elder elect and your elder uh, in training uh, the session needs God's uh, wisdom and we hope that you will pray for all of us but as for now let's pray together for our country let's pray for our church let's pray about this worship service today Heavenly Father we pray in the name of Jesus for your mercy. We pray that you would especially look upon our nation with compassion. And for the sake of the elect, for those who are the remnant, the people who are still crying out to you, we pray that you would spare us, O oh Lord, from the difficulties and the, the struggles that come with your chastening. We are deserving of it for sure, for we have been of people who have disregarded your word and dishonored you in many ways. But we pray for mercy, Lord, and that as Abraham said when he interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah, when he asked you to spare uh, the unrighteous for the sake of the righteous, Lord, we pray that you would do that for our nation. We pray for Hollywood Church to be blessed, that you would help its leaders to hear your voice and to follow you with their whole heart, that we would honor you in our leadership, and that we would mimic Jesus in his leadership. We pray for all who are worshiping with us this morning, remotely or in person, that there would be a great grace to fall upon us, and that there would be a wonderful time of rejoicing together, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ the Savior, in whose name we pray, amen. Thank you, and God bless you. Higher than the mountains that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant in the trial and the change One thing gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never
never gives up, never runs out on me, you Good morning, Hollywood Church. Today, before we do the Apostles' Creed, uh, we wanted to give you a little bit of why. So, starting this week and going through the rest of November, Pastor Keith's going to be preaching from Malachi, and he's going to be talking about the church and how it's kind of lost its luster for worship, how they've lost their zeal, and kind of how they've started getting um, monotonous in the ways that they worship. And so, with that... Um, especially in the music ministry and in the other things as part of our worship service, we are wanting to shake things up with our worship at, while he's preaching that sermon series. So you might notice when we're saying the Apostles' Creed today and in the following weeks and when we're doing music even last week and, and as we move forward, there will be some differences to how we would normally do things. Um, you might hear some traditional hymns that have a very different style, um, uh, last week we used African drums and the banjo, which is an African instrument, to try to give a different spice to Great Is Thy Faithfulness. And we're going to be trying to do that in different ways with different hymns and different music um, over the next month. And we're going to be trying to do that with the Apostles' Creed too, because we don't want to get into a place where we are saying it monotonously. I don't know if that's a word, but it is today. Um so we're going to use a little bit different phrasing. I might pause at different points. So make sure you listen, follow along, and say it directly from the heart. Praise the Lord. Let us recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Welcome to Hollywood Church's Time with the Children. This morning, we will be learning from the book, Big Book of Animal Devotions. This is a great book that has lots of information about different animals, and so if your child really likes to learn about animals, this would be a great devotion to add to your family library. Today, we are going to be doing the devotion called Bugs with Flashlights. Our scripture reading for today comes from Matthew 5:16. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. We used to catch them in glass jars. When we had a half dozen or more, it looked like a lantern. The light given off by fireflies in the jar was enough to read by. In the late spring and summer, they filled our backyards. When we held them against our finger, we felt a little heat each time they flashed. At the time, the flashes didn't mean anything to us, but each one meant a great deal to the fireflies. Actually, they are beetles. They are sending out message to flies that they could mate with. The male might hold his light on for half a second and the female sends back a flash. If the flashes are not timed correctly, the fireflies stay away. Sometimes a firefly might hold a flash for too long or wait too long to send it. 
the result may send it to the wrong insect. Because its signals were off, it might be eaten by a stranger. It is possible that some types send out the wrong signals on purpose. They aren't looking for a mate, just dinner. Many of us call the firefly a glow worm. They are easy to confuse since there are 2,000 types of bugs with lanterns on their tails. The firefly can control its light. A substance that can burn fills the firefly's tail section. When air gets to this section, it starts a small fire. The firefly can hold the substance back or push it forward. That is why fireflies are sometimes hard to catch. They simply turn off their lights. The air is breathed in so the firefly can stop the signal whenever it wants to. In the winter, fireflies become coal miners. They dig in to the top of the soil to escape the cold. If we were to dig them up, we might find their lamps still lit. They could be getting heat from their lanterns. Fireflies are used for beauty and light. In other countries, some women wear them on their dresses or as jewelry. Men who have had to travel in the dark often make lanterns from them or put them on their boots to light their paths. That's pretty cool. The fireflies will become excited and light more often. In some ways, you are like a firefly. Jesus told us to let our light shine before men. When people see our good behavior, we are like a light shining in darkness. When they see this light, they can then see the God we serve. Like fireflies, we control our light. We can make it shine as much as we want to. Right now, we can still be a light to those around us. Even though we're not able to go out to public places very much, you can still think about your friends and family or members of the church that you haven't seen in a while and do something special for them to let them know that God's light is still shining strong. I gave the youth a challenge this week, and I asked them to send a card or a little special note or maybe even a phone call to one of the elderly people in our church. That's something that you can do too. It doesn't have to be to someone in our church. It can be a friend that you haven't seen in a while, um, a grandparent or a family member, or maybe a neighbor. So this week, I would love for you to think of how you can share God's light to those around you during this time. You never know how much your little thoughtful action can really affect someone in a big way. Let's say a prayer to end our time. God, we thank you so much for fireflies and how fun they are to catch and play with in the summer, Lord. But most of all, we thank you for the way that they remind us about your light in the darkness, Lord. I pray that you will help all of us, that this week we will be able to share your light with someone else, Father. Give us a, an idea or a way that you desire for us to reach out, and I pray that you will put someone special in our hearts, Lord, that we can reach out to and share your love and your light with, Father. Bless all the families of Hollywood Church and everyone watching today, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, you all have a good week, and I'll see you next time.
you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, all it chases me down, fights still. Hollywood Church, we appreciate you taking the time to visit with us via media and to participate with, with us in the ministry of Hollywood Church. Our mission is to find and reach and develop fully committed followers of Jesus Christ who find their joy and their identity in Him. And so we are very appreciative that you would be involved in the ministry by uh, by witnessing firsthand what we're doing and then also by praying and uh, by supporting us financially. Thank you so much. We are in the second of a series of messages from the book of Malachi. The book of Malachi is the uh, last book in the Old Testament. It is extraordinarily uh, interesting and strategic. It's strategically placed because it fits perfect in the transition from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it is also strategic because the message is so timely. And so we are looking at how these things that were written so long ago, 400 years before the coming of Jesus, would have relevance and application to us in this particular time. The name Malachi means messenger. And in the book of Malachi, there are actually five different messengers. Malachi himself, and then in chapter 2 and verse 7, where it speaks of the lips of a priest, which is a part of the passage we're going to be looking at today, 
the true priest is a messenger. And thirdly, John the Baptist is referenced in chapter 3 and verse 1. Fourthly, the Messiah is referenced in chapter 3 and the first three verses as the great messenger, the genuine word of God, which of course was Jesus. And then there is Elijah mentioned in chapter 4 in verses 4 through 5. The book begins with the statement, the burden of the word of the Lord, or in other versions, the oracle of the word of the Lord. It is a prophetic word, a prophetic message, and it involves very much the, uh, the sins of the nation and how that they were, uh, the, the nation was beginning to deteriorate. And it was something happening from the inside out. In other words, there were still outward adherences to the expectations of the law, but inwardly there began to be this wincing and grimacing and, and kind of a bothered approach to the whole context of ministry. And so we're going to look at that some today. This book begins with a fundamental affirmation from God of his love for them. And it's extraordinarily important that we not omit that or overlook it because in some ways there are a lot of um, accusations that are brought against the people of God. First, the priesthood, and then secondly, the people. Uh, the priesthood from chapters 1, uh, verse 5, all the way through chapter 2, verse 9, and then the people beginning in chapter 2, verse 10, all the way up to the third chapter. So there are these strong accusations that are brought, but before the accusations are brought, there is this affirmation that is given from God of his extraordinary love and how that he chose them, even as God chose Jacob over Esau. Now, I'm telling you these things because the people were starting to doubt God's love. And that was the beginning of the unraveling as they doubted God's love for them because they saw Edom and the Edomites, the, the neighboring nation who despised Israel so bad, as they saw them rebuilding after the captivities, they heard them as they were speaking so um, hatefully toward Israel and so contemptibly. And they had hoped for God's judgment upon the Edomites, and instead God's judgment had fallen upon them. And so because of their chastening and because of Edom's mockery, the people were beginning to wonder in their heart whether God loved them. Now this is a very typical response for all of us when we are under duress and under trial especially under the chastening hand of God. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 says that no discipline is pleasant, even though it's profitable. Even though it does us good, it certainly does not feel good. And we sometimes cringe under God's hand, especially when we do not recognize the heart that is behind it. Well, as God was driving out idolatry, uh, from the people of Israel through the chastisement that he brought to them as he was sanctifying them in this process instead of being grateful and thankful for the restoration that they were experiencing by their return to uh, Jerusalem they were going through the rituals of worship and that ritual was not from the heart as it was supposed to be and so Malachi is really, in some ways, addressing worship, and he's addressing the heart. And God is speaking through his messenger with this formal affirmation that he brings about his love, but also these accusations that he is bringing because of the deterioration that they were experiencing from the inside. Now, why, why this is so critical and foundational to this message is because this is God doing to them what they were doing to him. They were questioning God. 
And so God turns the tables and begins to question them. At the root of this, there is a very fundamental assertion that needs to come out, and it is this. It is certainly acceptable to question God and God's actions, but there should always be a reverential uh, respect and honor behind the questioning of God's actions toward us. When Paul mentions this in Romans chapter 9, and he talks about people who question God's sovereignty and his hard providence. He says, who are you, O man, to speak thusly to God? In other words, Paul is saying, how can you have such a loss of respect in questioning God with such a, uh, an indifference and coldness? So God is questioning them in this book. And so around these questions, these accusations begin to come forth and he's being done through God's messenger. As I said to you, the first verse of the first chapter has to do with the burden of the word of the Lord. This was not an easy message for Malachi. In some ways, it was a very solemn and grave message, but Malachi was up to the task and so with this attentive and responsive reply to the questions of God's people, he brings forth the word of the Lord. And he does so in a courageous and confrontational kind of a way as he addresses first the priests and then secondly the people. So I'm going to read to you from chapter 2 beginning in verse number 1, which is where we pick up from where the sins of the priesthood are being listed. Uh, first, because in chapter 1 we learn that they had despised God's name and they had despised his name because they were defiling his altar by bringing polluted and uh, inappropriate sacrifices and accepting things that they should not have accepted in the worship of God. And so he continues by saying, in your doing so, you are detesting the routine that I am requiring of you, and in so doing, you are offending me and my holiness. And don't you know that my name is going to be famed throughout all the earth? As he gives a prophetic uh, declaration that the Gentiles will be brought into covenant relationship with him uh, as the Messiah comes and establishes the new covenant. So this reference that he's making is quite important to the fact that the priests are in the forefront leading the people into, into a wrong way by their own attitudes and their own actions. Let me, let me pick up the story here. In chapter 1 it says, A son honors his father and servants their master. But if I am your father, where is the honor due me? And if I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name? This is how God begins this indictment against the priesthood by saying, you despise my name, and uh, by, by this dishonor that is festering in your heart. Now in chapter 2, he continues talking to the priest by saying, And now, O priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not lay it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse on you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I've already cursed them because you do not lay it to heart. I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and I will put you out of my presence. Now, this is a very harsh word. This is God saying to the priest, because you are inwardly corrupt and not giving honor to me, then all these offerings that you're doing, and by the way, I don't mean to be crass here, but this is what happened whenever they killed the animals. Of course, there was, uh, there was always that accompanying act of dying, which is the release of all of those things that were in the intestines. And so God says, while you're trying to wear your clean priestly clothing and trying to, to present yourselves in a certain way, I'm going 
to take the feces and spread it all over you because that's the way you're treating me in such a contemptible and dishonorable way. What a hard word this is. I know it's hard for me to talk about, actually. But he goes on and says, Know then that I have sent this command to you that my covenant with Levi may, may hold, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was a covenant of life and well-being which I gave him. This called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in integrity and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people inasmuch as you have not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in your instruction. And with that indictment, he moves to the next accusation, which is formally against all the people of God. I'd like to draw your attention to a few major points in the passage that we have under consideration. First, please bear in mind that this has to do with worship and it has to do particularly with the priests. You may say, uh, well, the first one has application to me because I understand that I am called to worship God, but not so much as a priest. You, the speaker, you're the priest, not me. That is just not right. <laughs> you are a part of the priesthood of God. One of the major tenets of the Reformation was the priesthood of all believers. In other words, the Lord chose you and me and all of the church that we would be a royal priesthood, meaning that is our calling. What does a priest do? Well, a priest was called upon to represent God to the people and the people to God. In other words, this whole matter is uh, a matter of us representing God properly, especially to the people and representing the people in prayer as we come to him to pray and intercede. So that was the duty of a priest. And when God saved and, and redeemed you and me in his good graces, he installed us into the, the ministry, he put all of us into the ministry of the word and to the ministry of the priesthood. Now this is so critically important, I want to underscore it by saying that you have been called to be priests. And as such, you are clothed like the priest, you have been crowned with the priestly uh, apparel, you have been cleansed like the priests were cleansed, and you have been called to go to God and to represent people before the Lord. So therefore, you have a special honor that has been bestowed upon you as being in the priesthood. So you cannot claim an exemption from the things that are being talked about in chapter 2. And one of the main parts of this is that you are called to a particular worship of God that includes service. Now, there are two different major words that are used for the word worship. And I'm going to give you an example of those two words right now using the same verse in the Greek language. When the devil came to Jesus to tempt him in the wilderness after he had been fasting for 40 days, one of the things that he required of Jesus or requested of Jesus was that he fall down and worship him. And in response to that, the devil promised that he would give to Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. Well, Jesus' response was, uh, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you worship or serve. Now, those two different words, the first one is the word doxa from which we get the word doxology. The second one, and him only shall you worship, is the word latreo, from which we get the word liturgy. The first word is, a, is an attitude of the heart, of giving praise and honor and glory to God. The second one is the word of worship that has to do with serving God. 
In other words, in, in the uh, celebration of God, we have the, the horizontal and the vertical, the vertical being the doxa, where we come into the presence of God and we worship him, and then the service being the horizontal, where we actually serve God through serving other people. The first part is a, is a kind of a celebration of grace, and the other one is kind of the, the application of that celebration into normal life. Well, this is really about the priesthood and what's going on. God requires of them that their worship be uh, ethical toward others and that it be genuine toward him. So in this, we begin that passage in Malachi chapter 2 with a, a serious and solemn call to listen. This is what the Bible says. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name or to glorify my name, then I will send the curse upon you and your children. Now, let me, let me draw your attention to this word, the word listen. God is saying the first part of worship as a priest is to listen to God, to give the reverence to his word that is due to his name. In other words, this listening is critical to all of the other things that come after it, all of our service. We must have an ear to God. Now listen to me. Think with me. There were three different things that were done when a priest or high priest was installed. He had a, a number of things to go through in the ceremony of ordination and installation. But one of the curious and odd things was the blood of a sacrificial animal was to be applied to the ear and to the thumb and to the right toe of the high priest. You say, what? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Blood of a sacrificial animal applied to the ear. Why? Because a priest's first duty was to listen to the word of God, to hear God's word. The second thing applied to his hands. Why? Because all that he did was supposed to be sanctified by the blood of the, that the Lord was providing for cleansing. And then to his toes because God expected him to walk in integrity. Now this is exactly what we find as being the themes in Malachi chapter 2. And in the, in the context of all of this being done to glorify or to honor God. Now, Oswald Chambers said, we used to think that the chief end of man was to glorify God. Now we are tempted to say the chief end of God is to gratify man. And that is just what was happening in Malachi chapter 2. The priests were dissatisfied. They were wanting God to gratify them. They were wanting God to to do things for them, and because he wasn't doing what they wanted, their service began to be lackluster, their listening to God didn't have that, that uh, intentionality that God intended. And so what was happening was they were doing the act without the attitude. Spiritual worship is an attitude rather than an act. It's related rather to temper than to time, said one of the Puritans and it is related rather to principle more so than to place. It is not something into which we can project ourselves for occasions, but it is a state of soul, a wholehearted submission to the sovereign, holy, loving will of God. God cannot be truly worshipped unless and until he is known, and he cannot be known until he is heard. And so the priests were required to listen to what God was saying. Now this worship that was supposed to affect the attitude of their hearts was not doing that. They were just doing the activities, but it was rather a routine. This has an application to every one of us, doesn't it? We can sit down to listen and not really hear. We can be like a read where these two men were talking over coffee one day. One of them said, I'm concerned about my wife. She talks to herself a lot these days. The other one said, mine does too, but she doesn't know it. She thinks I'm listening. <laughs> um, the, 
idea here is that sometimes we can sit down and act like we're listening to God and not really be engaged with all of our heart to what the Lord is saying to our soul. That is a temptation. It was exactly what was happening in the last few verses of Ezekiel chapter 33 where it says, My people come and sit as the people sit. They hear my words, but they do not do them. You're, you're like a musical instrument to them, Ezekiel. They're entertained by you, but they're not engaged with me. That was the essence of what was happening in the time that Ezekiel was, uh, was uh, showing them the error of their ways. And so the first part of listening is, uh, is to pay attention with all of your heart to God, knowing the blessedness that comes from listening and the cursing that comes from disregarding him. The second thing about worship, besides listening, is to have the right longing. In other words, to have a longing to do your very best in, as you present yourself to the Lord, to give yourself fully. Now, in the example that is used in Malachi chapter 2, God uses the original covenant that was made with the tribe of Levi. And how that in the beginning, as the priest would read through the book of Leviticus, they had a heart to do things right and to do the right things. As a matter of fact, they learned early on from the example of two of the sons of Aaron who became flippant and careless in the way that they executed the duties of the priesthood. Why, they, they saw and witnessed firsthand that God took them out. He killed them. And he told Aaron, their father, you can't even mourn over them because they've disregarded me. So the covenant that God made with Levi, with Aaron in the beginning, was upheld and honored. And so God says about this, these beautiful, beautiful words. Listen, in Malachi chapter 2, he says, uh, My covenant that I had was a covenant with life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. Now, this is another aspect of priestly ministry and service, and one of God's requirements is that we fear God. Now, that means that we give him reverence and that there is a certain trepidation, that coming into his presence means that we recognize, his, that, we recognize that he has the power to obliterate us, the power to bring calamity upon us, to devastate us. There is no fear of God before their eyes was one of the accusations that was made in Romans chapter 3. And that's one of the things that can truly be said about our culture. And it should never be said about that of people who are in the covenant of grace like we are, the priests who serve him, that there is no fear of God. But originally, God says that Levi stood in awe of my name. He feared me. And true instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. This is another one of the requirements of worship that God has for all of us. And it's one of the indictments that he had against Israel that they weren't doing, and that is speaking the truth, speaking the truth about his word, speaking the truth about God. One of the things that made God so angry with the friends of Job at the end of the book of Job was that these people who had come to Job to give his counsel had not said what was right about him. Now that should put fear in all of our hearts because I know many people who, because they do not know God nor theology, say things about him that are just wrong all the time. I mean, think of it. My God doesn't do so and so. My God wants you to be happy. My God would rather for you to get out of this marriage than he had for you to be unhappy. My God, etc. These are false depictions of the, the God of the Bible, and they are so offensive to him. And the Lord was saying about these priests that originally true instruction was in their lips, and true instruction was, was a part of their uh, daily living. But now because of the loss of their uh, a heart attitude because of the, the disruption and the corruption that was in their heart as they were not giving themselves over fully to worship while that was going away. 
You see, this attitude of longing to do what was right that was originally in the hearts of the people was beginning to wane. And so it says about him that the lips of a priest should be uh, guarding knowledge. It says the lips of a priest should be always true. But instead of them doing like Levi did and turning, turning many from, un, uh, from unrighteousness, while they were turning people toward unrighteousness by their example. Now this is a very important principle. It means that we, the church, have at our doorstep the blame of a lot of the ills of our society because we ourselves have been cavalier in our attitude toward God, our worship of God, because we've not taken his word seriously. The, the, the culture is following by the breaking of the covenants that, uh, that we, had, uh, we, we were intended to, to follow. I'm, I'm not going to get into this except just to mention that in chapter 2 and verse 10 for next Sunday, one of the obvious consequences that was seen of the people after the priests had not from their heart been following God's word was the people were, were putting away their wives and their husbands and there were lots of divorces and there were a lot of covenant breaking that was taking place in the, in the nation. Well, the reason for that was because the priests themselves weren't taking the covenants seriously, the ones that they had their ordination vows, etc. And so God is bringing this to their attention that they needed to listen, that they needed to long to do what was right and to do that in their heart. You see, the priests in the days of Malachi were very degenerate. It was to them principally that the prophet is addressing himself and he says that the degeneracy of the people is owing largely to the corruption that was going on in the priesthood. I am afraid that there are many who are not following God because they have seen those who profess to be following God who do not live a markedly different life. And that is something that all of us should, should certainly be very bothered about. And God was saying, if you will take these things to heart, there will be blessing. In other words, in chapter 2, he says, I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I've already cursed them. One of the big differences between a covenant and a promise is that there are attending blessings that accompany obeying covenants, and there are attending curses that come along with disregarding those covenants. And so here the priest had made this covenant with God and God had made this covenant with them. And because the people were not paying attention uh, as priests to their ordination vows and their installation vows, the people were beginning to veer away from the truth themselves. And they were disregarding the covenants like the marriage covenants that they were making. I fear sometimes that this is one of the problems with our own culture, that the church has been so busy condemning things that are, uh, are a part of our culture and, and not paying attention to the sins in our own house. I think the Bible says in the book of First Peter that judgment begins at the house of God. It must begin at the house of God. And so here the Lord is bringing all of these, these statements to bear upon the priesthood and expects them to do the following. The lips of a priest should guard knowledge and people should seek instruction from his mouth. What God intended from the beginning was that his priests, his people, be so reputable, so different, so reliable, so trustworthy that people would seek out their counsel. But instead, these priests were causing others to stumble and they were doing things that were bringing a reproach upon God. I believe this word is a very important word for us all who are a part of the body of Christ. I think that we're living in very incivil and very uh, uncivil times. And I think that we as a church are culpable. We are responsible. And God is calling us all to reckon with this matter 
of how we have not honored his name in carrying out from the heart the things that he has required of us in priestly service. Everything from intercessory prayer to making sacrifices to listening, paying attention to him and doing his work and walking in his ways. So may the Lord cause us to have a spirit of repentance as we ponder and reflect upon this biblical passage that we've considered today. Thank you very much. God bless you.